Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Pi Lin, Assistant Professor of Chemistry and a Residential Fellow at Saga College. I warmly welcome you to this joint event between Diversity Week and Saga College Rector's Tea. The Diversity Week is an annual Yale and U.S. tradition that brings the campus community together to celebrate our commonalities and our differences. The Saga College Rector's Tea, on the other hand, aims to bring in diversity in intellectual thoughts. Tonight's guest, Wang Chenwei, exemplifies this diversity in his music. The mesmerizing piece that you just heard on the piano is entitled Mid-Autumn Festival, performed by our very talented music educator, Chu Ren Li. This piece was composed by Chen Wei. Chen Wei is the composer in residence of the Singapore Chinese Orchestra, adjunct faculty at the National Institute of, Fed uh, of Education, National Institute of Education, and the council member of the Singapore Chinese Music Federation. He has been composing since young, and at age 17, his composition, The Sisters Islands, won the Singapore Composer Award. After high school, he went to the University of Music and Performing Art in Vienna and studied both composition and audio engineering, a very liberal arts combination indeed. Over the years, he has been very active in music scenes in Singapore and beyond. Chen Wei's works are known to transcend boundaries between different cultures, as you will hear in today's program. Beyond composition, he plays more than a dozen instruments and has learned many languages. I'm sure he will have many interesting perspectives and stories to share. I'm delighted that he has taken time out of his busy schedule to be with us here today. This evening, Chen Wei will be engaging in a conversation with our student moderator, Karin Chan Ziqing. Karin is a third year history major from the class of 2023, who plays the piano, violin, suona, which is the Chinese horn, arhu, or the Chinese two string bridle, and the electone. She also arranges and composes as a hobby. We look forward to the invigorating conversation. I will now hand over the proceedings to Karin. Please join me in welcoming Wang Shenwei and Karin Chan on stage. Hello, Shenwei. Thank you for taking time to be here. We just heard your composition, the Mid-Autumn Festival. Uh, could you tell us a little more about your piece? OK, sure. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, it's my great honor to be here tonight to uh, share about my music. And uh, thank you, uh, uh, Professor Zhuang, for inviting me. And thank you, uh, Karin, for um, uh, hosting. <laughs> right. OK, so uh, this Mid-Autumn Festival is actually a compo uh, commissioned by the Singapore National Piano and Violin Competition 2019 as a set piece for the piano uh, senior category. OK, so uh, if, you have, uh, if you are familiar with the song entitled Shiwu uh, Yue Liang, so uh, the moon on the 15th, uh, you have recognized that as the, uh, the, the, main, uh, the main theme from this uh, piece as derived from that, right? So this is a deliberate reference to the uh, Mid-Autumn Festival. Okay, so um, yeah, uh, basically, um, so uh, this uh, national piano and violin competition is held uh, twice every year, uh, sorry, once every two years by the Singapore Symphony Orchestra. And then they said, uh, yeah, well, you can compose anything. So I thought, you know, maybe I'll do something representative about Singapore. So uh, we've got the, like four pieces, so two for piano, two for violin. Uh, all right, by, by the way, we can take our masks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right, so, um, yes, uh, and then I thought, uh, so, so maybe I'll have, uh, you know, um, have four festivals of Singapore, so one uh, Chinese, one Malay, one uh, Indian, and one that is for, for everybody, so the everybody one was National Day anyway. Okay, so uh, then for Chinese one, I thought, uh, you know, maybe uh, Chinese New Year is a bit overused, or as we like <laughs> to say in English, a bit obyang. So <laughs> then, then I'll just, I thought, okay, I'll try to do something that sounds more classy, so I'll chose the mid-autumn uh, festival, right? Okay, so this piece, as you probably have uh, 
uh, uh, heard uh, also there are, there are like uh, figurations of typical of Chinese instruments like the Gu Zheng, Yang Qin, and the Pi Pa. Um, it, uh, it is actually uh, harder to use the piano to express a uh, Chinese flavor as compared to, you know, let's say the violin because um, a lot of the nuances of Chinese music lies in the slides, right? And you can't, can't do a glide on the piano. So I have to use other ways to um, present that. So mainly using the figurations like uh, 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 and the scales. So uh, one point, uh, one special technique I would like to point out is this part here. So uh, as you can see, I'm wearing my uh, fake fingernails, okay, uh, acrylic fingernails for the uh, P part. Um, and I shall try to uh, show what I mean by this on the P part, right? Uh, just a disclaimer, I, I never properly learned the pipa. It's, <laughs> it's just one of the many instruments that I've uh, tried to uh, learn, learn a bit to, uh, you know, just to understand how, how it works, basically. Okay, so uh, before I come to this technique called the Tiaolun, I have to uh, uh, explain what a Wu Zi Lun is. So Wu Zi Lun is a five-finger tremolo, literally. Uh, Lun means wheel or, or like, a, you know, cycle, right? So it goes like, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. Right, so you go up, flip pluck each finger out in motion. And when you do it very quickly, you have a continuous stream of sound. Okay, it's, sorry, it's not a very good demo because I, I, uh, I rarely practice the pipa actually. Okay, so uh, then you can play a melody, so for example. Right, you can have a continuous melody like this. Uh, and then now the tiao lun is uh, what happens to the tiao lun is that uh, you have uh, with every stroke of the thumb instead of plucking the same string you can pluck another a different string uh, a lower string so that you have the illusion of uh, having like two different uh, voices going at once. So for example, right, and then and then I can pluck the lower string. Right. So for example. Uh, if I do it in slow motion, it sounds like this. Right, uh, so actually at only one, at any one time, there's only one note being sounded. But uh, if I play it quickly, it sounds like there's two voices. So that's the the Tiaolun technique, and that's uh, I used it this uh, onto the translated this onto the piano. So uh, Karen, would you like to try playing this? Okay, yes, I will try translating it into piano. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. So, so actually, um, I, 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 uh, uh, I gave the excuse that because I'm wearing my, my, the nails, so I can't play the piano as an excuse to force uh, <laughs> Karin to play something. Right, okay, thank you very much. Yeah, okay, so this is uh, imitating the, uh, 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 using the piano to imitate this uh, pipa technique, right? Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for sharing about the Mid-Autumn Festival. You mentioned that you have learned multiple instruments, even if just barely in passing. Which instrument did you learn first? And do you think that learning another instrument actually helps you learn subsequent instruments? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the first instrument I learned was the piano. And I think it's uh, uh, important for all musicians to be able to, to play the piano, right? Um, uh, actually, I, I learned, it, learned the piano quite late. It wasn't like, uh, you know, uh, 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 because forced by a tiger mom or tiger dad. And by the way, happy tiger year to all uh, tiger moms and tiger dads. <laughs> okay, so uh, yeah, basically when I was age six, I got like a toy keyboard as a birthday 
present and I just started tinkling on it and eventually uh, my parents sent me for a piano lessons like quite a long a uh, 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 while later. Um, and uh, so, so that was my first uh, instrument and after that uh, when I was in secondary school and enrolled in a Chinese orchestra uh, and I was assigned to this instrument called a ruan, which is a round, uh, round lute. Um, and then after a while, I got bored of it, so <laughs> I started trying out the other instruments uh, in lying around in the uh, Chinese orchestra room. Uh, yeah, and then uh, so so uh, um, I also tried to like uh, consciously try to uh, you know find opportunities to play different instruments you know, just for. To, to have for the experience, right? And so uh, at first it was just for fun, and then uh, as I began to focus more on composing, I um, uh, also started to look at learning instruments with a more strategic goal, that is to uh, understand how each instrument works, you know, not just like looking at a chart and say, okay, they can play this note to this note and uh, write on it. Uh, and this is especially important for Chinese instruments because each instrument has such a strong character Right, uh, it's not like a Western instruments. Basically, uh, if you look at a range chart, you know what's the highest and lowest note, and then you write something for it. Somehow the instrument will be able to to play. It. I mean, most most of the combinations are uh, will be playable in some way, right? But for Chinese instruments, like you know, even if you just write one note out of place, then it might uh, just uh, like uh, something that is very easy to play might become very awkward to play, right? So. Um, for now, when I compose a piece for Chinese orchestra, actually, uh, if, I, uh, if I'm not in a rush to submit, I'll actually play through every single instrument's part from beginning to the end uh, before I, I submit. So, so uh, except for a few instruments that are too big for me to uh, you know, keep at home, uh, but, but otherwise, most of the small instruments, I will play through them. I think it's very important. Yeah. Oh, yeah and you asked about um, whether uh, 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 it's easier to learn more uh, instruments uh, I believe it does help, uh, but that, that it, it is a double edged sword, I would say. Right, so for example, um, with my, my run technique, I can um, use that on the left hand of the pipa, right, but the right hand is, is a very different technique. Uh, if the technique is actually quite different, actually, that is fine, but uh, I think the problem comes if you have two instruments with a, a similar technique, but they are not actually the same, the same right, then you will uh, end up. Uh, you know, for for example, um, the, um, uh, if you if you learn the cello first and then you learn the violin, then mm -hmm. you might be ending up trying to play the violin like uh, using a cello kind of uh, a bow grip, and then yeah. which which of course would be wrong for the uh, instrument. So uh, yeah, it depends actually. Oh, okay, I see. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, you have also another very interesting piece called Confluence, which combines Indian and Malay-Indonesian musical styles with Western compositional techniques, and which is played on Chinese instruments. It was even shared by PM Lee Hsien Loong on his Facebook page. Can you tell us more about this piece and its background? What are your creative processes and what inspired you to create this piece? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, Confluence. Uh this was actually com a first commission by uh, the Dingyi Music Company when they founded in 2009, uh, right? So, so that was like uh, the, the, when they first started out. Um, and, and then they also likewise said that you can compose anything, right? <laughs> then I said, okay, so what, what do I uh, compose? And uh, I thought I would, also, I would write uh, something that is representative of, of Singapore. So, so I thought I would um, you know, combine the musical elements of the four uh, races or, or like uh, you know, at, at least you know, uh, uh, it is. Uh, uh, of course, Singapore is not just four races, but um, uh, as in this is just a symbolic representation of uh, Singapore, right? Um, so uh, I I used uh, uh, before that actually I have been um, trying to uh, get more exposure to Indian music, right? So uh, after my uh, JC, I actually. Uh, walked up to the Temple of Fine Arts, which is an Indian music school in Singapore. And, and then I just said, uh, uh, you know, I, I play Chinese instruments. And if you have a concert that needs a Chinese instruments, I'll volunteer myself. <laughs> and so they actually really called me up. Uh, and so I participated in one of the concerts. And so that was uh, my first immersion in Indian music, right? which was uh, uh, one of the, the uh, factors that 
uh, strongly influenced uh, this piece, right? Um, so I uh, tried to use uh, 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 Indian music style for one of the, the first theme and uh, Malay music style for the second theme. Okay, so uh, I, I'll, I'll try to play this. It's actually not written for Pipa, uh, but um, since I have this here, I'll try to write it. So this uh, theme has an Indian flavor. It, it is not uh, uh, based on any particular Indian raga, uh, but just like uh, uh, was like uh, evoked my uh, impressions of, of like Indian music as like what I heard in the uh, concert that I participated in. Okay, the second theme uh, uses the uh, Pelox Silesia scale. So this is a very uh, commonly heard scale uh, whenever we talk about uh, Gamilan, actually it's uh, the scale that is most uh, 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 cited, you know, when whenever composers want to um, write something about Gabilan. Okay, so it's like uh, try try to play that. Right, that this is the scale. Okay, so I'll try to play this. So. That is the, the second theme. Okay, so um, this is uh, um, uh, in a, the Gamilan scale. Also, is just symbolically used to uh, represent the uh, uh, you know the indigenous peoples of the uh, Malay archipelago, which of course uh, you know it's it's a very diverse. Uh, it's a it's very di ethnically very diverse too. It's not to say that you know Gamilan represents uh, you know Malay culture or Indonesian. Culture, but uh, you know, just as a uh, also a symbolic uh, meaning, right? Uh, so that is the the first two themes, and I think we can uh, listen to a performance of it, uh, and, and then uh, when we come to the halfway point, I'll stop and uh, talk about uh, other things. Okay, so this was two thousand fourteen, uh, and the conductor was me. <laughs>
Okay, I'll pause here for a moment, uh, and then uh, I'll explain what comes uh, up next. Um, okay, so after this, we uh, I've got a fugue, which um, is like a, a style of composition that uh, originated from the Baroque times, like a, uh, um, to that uh, where where you have like a, a theme that is being developed and passed around different instruments in imitation. Okay, so uh, this, uh, in the middle section, I have uh, the subject of the fugue is an uh, Indian style, and then uh, after that, uh, the counter subject is like, uh, has, uh, is uh, in this uh, Gamilan scale, the Peloxalicia scale. Okay, so I'll try to play a bit of this. Okay, so that is the, the uh, subject, and then the counter subject. Okay, so uh, as you can hear in the counter subject, there is a, a, a rhythm, uh, like a cross rhythm that sounds like it's like a dun, 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 so like it's in a different meter from the, uh, the time signature. Right, so this is uh, what I mean here by the cross rhythm of uh, a three eighths against a four four beta, right? I see. Um, okay, and, and then after that, uh, at the end uh, of the piece, it uh, recapitulates the, the first section, so the, what we've heard just now, and builds up the grand ending, where four main melodic motifs are presented simultaneously in uh, counterpoint. So, uh, I'll try to play, uh, explain this on the piano when I just uh, need to take out my nails. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, the first one at the top it goes is a fast one. Okay, so this comes from the uh, the, the the main theme, which goes uh, So everything is condensed into a very fast uh, figure. And then the uh, second part of the first theme uh, is uh, on the second, the lower part. Right. And then below that, uh, I have the, the fugue subject. And then uh, below that, they have the opening motif, the -dum -bum 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 -bum. so that, that rhythmic motif. Right. So uh, all these four of that all, uh, uh, elements are combined together uh, at the end, the, the climax of the piece. Okay, so uh, let's hear this.
That was a very masterfully crafted piece. Thank you for sharing that with us. Talking about fusion, what do you think is fusion music? Okay. Um, <laughs> oh yeah. Before that, uh, this was a uh, uh, um, a confluence. Uh, was uh, I, I made an arrangement for, of it for like a, a small like a. Uh, uh, on on some of uh, Chinese and and uh, ethnic instruments, and then this was performed uh, by the Xin Yue Miao Si on some uh, on Guo Yue Da Dian. This is a, a Chinese a mainland Chinese uh, program about uh, Chinese music, um, and this was the <laughs> host. Okay, so uh, fusion. I, I will say okay. So we have different uh, levels of uh, fusion. Um, it, at the most uh, like. Uh, Superficial level, it would be like uh, you know Chinese instrument perform a Malay song, so so it's like a uh, we have a cross cultural performance, okay. And then we also have a combination. So for example, if musicians of different cultural backgrounds, uh, you know, play play a, a, a you know let's say a Malay folk song, right? And then maybe the effect will be enhanced if they wear the traditional costume. <laughs> so yeah, then uh, yeah, okay. Then uh, uh, what I'm trying to achieve is the fusion in content, so it's not just the uh, appearance, but uh, the musical content uh, itself. Okay, so and this one I will classify in, into three ways too. So first is successive fusion, so that means we have uh, two elements presented successively in the same piece, right? Uh, may, maybe like you know, in one piece, in one section, I have a, a Chinese, and then after that, the next section is Malay, for example. Uh, and the two B is. Uh, Contrapuntal fusion, so that means the two elements are presented simultaneously in counterpoint, right? And this is harder to do than the earlier one because uh, you need to make sure that they they harmonize yeah. uh, well when, when they are played together, right? You know, not not like played together in a jumble, but when they combine together to form something harmonious. Uh, so that requires uh, more uh, thought into the compositional techniques. Uh, and this is what I use in confluence. So, for example, like in the field with the Indian subject and the Gamelan style counter subject. Right here, I try to um, visually represent it. So we have uh, two letters, like one after the other, and this one is when when they uh, in counterpoint. So they they are uh, distinct, but they fit together to form a a, a, a bigger pattern. Okay. Uh, third one is a hybrid fusion. So it's like a child born of a father of race A and mother of race B. So the child has features of both A and B, but you cannot uh, distinguish that, uh, that, okay, this part of the child is, uh, you know, let's say Chinese, and this part of the child is Indian, but uh, it's like you have uh, these dual characteristics. Uh, yeah, and, and so the visualization will be like this. So I, I drew the S and G together. So there's the G in the S and there's the S in the G also, right? Yeah. And so you have an example of the hybrid fusion. Would you like to show that? Yeah. Golden snake or pagoda tree? Right. So this is uh, a piece com commissioned by Reverberance, which is a Singaporean Chinese wind and percussion ensemble. Uh, and they specifically uh, requested to compose a fusion of a Chinese piece, a dance of the golden snake with uh, carnatic rhythm. So carnatic is, uh, in music is south, the uh, uh, music of South India. Okay, so, uh, and then I uh, went to research about Carnatic music and I um, incorporated two uh, types of rhythmic cadences. So one is the Korbe and one is the Kurepe. Okay, so uh, a rhythmic cadence uh, is something that comes like near the end of a, a phrase or a section that uh, uh, follows some kind of pattern that, that leads to, uh, usually leads to a climatic uh, um, ending or a climatic uh, Punctuation in, in the in the section, okay. Um, so this is uh, my attempt at the, the third type of uh, fusion, which is the hybrid fusion, right? Uh, and also, I should point out that it's also fusion without Western music as a medium, right? So one thing that we usually we we notice about fusion in in most of the uh, uh, fusion that we we heard or, or most of the music that's presented as fusion is that uh, usually it is it means uh, ethnic music presented through a Western lens, mm. which could be a pop or a classical lens. But uh, you know, for example, it's like uh, you take a some kind of folk song and then you harmonize it, yes. and then that becomes a fusion. Or, or I like take a, some traditional tune and then 
uh, add uh, like a pop, uh, you know, guitars and, and drum set and, uh, 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 and, and a synthesizer, and, and that becomes a fusion, right? So uh, the, the, um, it is not very much explored, like a fusion, like uh, for example, between Chinese and Indian, or like Hokkien and Teochew, right? It's, uh, uh, you, you actually don't, if you think about it, you actually don't need, necessarily need the Western aspect to be the fusion, and, and that is also what I'm trying to experiment with in my pieces also. Right? So in this piece, it's actually it's, uh, just that the elements are Chinese and uh, Indian, and there's, uh, there are minimal Western elements, right? like uh, elements like uh, harmony. I, I mean, there is harmony in the piece, but it's not like the, the main thing. Western uh, harmony. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, mean, I mean, you can't really escape from Western <laughs> harmony entirely, but, but it is not a, like a feature or not mm. the main, main feature of the fusion. It's not uh, uh, the incorporation of Western elements, right? So, uh, so now I'll introduce the uh, rhythmic uh, patterns first. First is a cold bear. Okay, so this was, I, I learned this from a, a, a video. Um, Unfortunately, the video has been taken down, but um, I, I uh, transcribed the, the uh, rhythm there. So it was recited by this uh, a guru called uh, BC Manjunath. Um, I, I, I think uh, some of you might have seen his like, viral videos of him <laughs> reciting extremely complex uh, uh, rhythms. Yeah. I, I don't think I've seen it, but I'm pretty sure like some of our profs might have seen it, or some of you might have seen it. Yeah. yeah. Has anyone okay. seen it before? Anyway, uh, if you haven't, you can just um, search his name on, on YouTube. We have a lot, a lot of uh, videos, right? And, and then, then you got, got one in a one Fibonacci sequence or something like that. <laughs> so, yeah, okay. Uh, and, and then, uh, okay, so it goes like this. Uh, uh, in the um, kinetic music, there's this, the most uh, common, like, sort of time signature, as we will understand it in Western terms, is the, called the Adi Tala. So which is an eight beat pattern and that and uh there's a counting like a, a hand gesture so it's one two the two is the the pinky then three is the ring finger four is the middle finger then five six seven eight oh. okay so actually we get everybody can count <laughs> together so one two three four five six seven, eight. Okay, so if you uh, see um, like some kinetic uh, music performances, you quite often see like the, like the musicians or, or singers, they, they will be like, like you know, counting all, all the, uh, uh, throughout the whole, whole uh, performance, right? Okay, so uh, then with the recitation, it goes like this. Ta, gu, ta, jam, ta, ri, ta. Ta, jam, ta, ri, ta. Ta, ta, ka, di, na, ta, di, gi, na, tom. Ta di gi na tom 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 ta. Okay, so uh, maybe we, uh, first first round we'll just uh, clap the, uh, the 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 regular beats first, right? Uh, 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 they don't need to recite first. Maybe after the second time we'll try to recite together. Okay, uh, uh, okay, and go. Ta gu ta jam ta ri ta. Ta jam ta ri ta 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 ka di na ta di gi na tom 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 ta. Okay, would you like to try to uh, recite this together also? Oh, okay. Wow, the rhythm is a bit confusing. Okay, uh, if you can't uh, like dual dual uh. Uh, how's it? The du <laughs> dual core processing, you can just <laughs> recite without clapping. It actually takes quite a bit of practice to get it because yeah, after, uh, after a while you get affected, and, and then because the, the uh, phrasing of the it's recitation different. and the phrasing of the, uh, the, 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 the sort of time signature is different, it's and that's something that we uh, are not used to in Western music or Chinese music. Yeah. So after a while, you start to, to clap on the beats on the that, beat. that, on the, that are accented yes. in the uh, thing uh, uh, in the in the recitation and, and, and rather than where you are supposed to clap according to the meter, yeah. and I was you know practicing on this on a flight or uh, <laughs> uh, you know maybe because you know when during takeoff like the everything is dark you can't read and then it's shaky also and that's so what just you know doing that and then the flight attendant was like sir um 
uh, would you like to, <laughs> what, what are you, uh, do, do you need something? Or, right? so, <laughs> yeah, okay, so, uh, uh, yeah, shall we try that? Okay, and okay, go. Wait, where does it start? Uh, a, start? The, a first bar. Okay, okay so I, I uh, wrote this into the, uh, this time signature is like a one minimum corresponds to yes. one beat. So of course, um, I, mean, I mean, all this doesn't exist in the kinetic music. Mm. It's just a representation that is easier for, uh, Western uh, yeah, trained musicians. To, to, to get a hang of. Okay, so. Okay, let's try. And go. Ta, 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 Oh. Okay, so <laughs> really cannot tell processing. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay, so now now let's uh, analyze this uh, uh, thing. Okay, so um, we we notice that at the start we have the rhythm strongly aligned with the talas beats that es mm -hmm. establish the ta pulse of tala. So at the start, this uh, like you know uh, the kind of rhythm is familiar to like mm -hmm. in Western music or Chinese music is like you know so so it's like the the uh, beats of the the. It's on uh, the main beat. Yeah, the phrasing of the uh, melody all right, or, or the rhythm is uh, aligned with the meter. And then from the, this uh, fourth bar onwards, you start to have the rhythms like crossing over the bar lines. And, and like, uh, uh, so uh, if we analyze this, so you see a tadi ginatum is a group of five. Mm -hmm. And the first time it is five times 1.5. So because it's a dotted uh, mm, yes. uh, crotchet, right? So it's, to three, D to three, G. So it's one, two, three, two, two, three, 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 two, three, four, three, 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 four, three, three, five, two, three. And then after that, it becomes five times one. So uh, one, two, one, and two, and three, and four, and five. And then the last time is five times half, right? So, so it's a half a bit. Okay, so that means it is uh, like. One two three two two three three two three four two three five two three one two 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 three two four two five two one two three four five two two three four five three two three four five right and then it is all time to end um, on the uh, uh, on the the back on the one okay so this is uh, two uh, Adi Tala cycles right uh, so now we have a uh, more detailed an analysis. Uh, so we have this acceling, accelerating phrases that sound like they are in a different meter than the tala, which creates a polyrhythmic feel. Mm -hmm. Polyrhythmic means like we have uh, you know different rhythms different occurring rhythm. at the same time, uh, and thus also rhythmic tension. Yeah. Right when when your your rhythm uh, and the meter is aligned, then there's, the tension is lower, and when you have um, this offbeat, yeah, off beats, right, it increases the rhythmic tension. Uh, and then we also notice that there there are a, there's an odd number of quavers per phrase that create an alternation between on-beat and off-beat accent. So you see the ta, the first ta is uh, on the on-beat, the next one is on the off-beat, then the next one is on off-beat, then on-beat, and then the off-beat. Mm -hmm. right? So uh, this alternation also like, you know, sort of like, uh, keeps you on the edge of your seat, right? Uh, it increases the tension, and then the shortening of the note values further increases the rhythmic tension. So you have this because of the acceleration, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then the tension is finally resolved on the first beat, right? And if you have a repeat, uh, then from this uh, irregular rhythm, you go back to a regular rhythm and that lowers the tension. And then throughout the cycle, you build up the tension again and you uh, re uh, resolve the tension. Again. So this, uh, if you look at it, actually, the design is very simple. Uh, it's not very complex math, but uh, if you analyze it like this, it's actually a very clever, Design, yes. right, and 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 uh, you don't have this kind of thing in Western music, yeah. Uh, so the first uh, 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 in my this piece, I wrote uh, two uh, chord pairs. So first one goes like this. So rest two three four. Okay, so, so it uses a similar structure as what we've seen in the, the previous slide. And where does this melodic come from? Oh. Oh. So I use 
that that this it comes from the the very Isabel. iconic golden snake. Yeah, the golden snake, right? So uh, now the second uh, corvée corvée it has a bit of a variation. So I started with the. One, two, three, two, two, three, three, two, three, four, two, three, five, two, three, one, and two, and three, and four, and five, and one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so now you see the difference is that uh, in the Corvair one, I started with uh, two beats of rest, which is equal to four quaver counts of rest. And then uh, in the second one, I just redistributed the four mm. quaver rests into uh, near the end of it. Near the end of the, yes. the place. The, the, the one, two, three, four, five, ten, so uh, rest, 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 rest. Right, so it's just a slight variation of the, the first one. Um, okay, then after that, the next uh, uh, rhythmic pattern I use is called the kurepe, which means reduction. Okay, so this is a sequence of call and response phrases in decreasing length. So for example, you have a call in eight beats and response eight beats, call four beats, response four beats, and then uh, like uh, two beats, then one beats, and finally you combine together. So uh, this, uh, I wrote a section on this, so it goes like this. Uh, okay, so it actually uh, begins uh, on the second beat, right? As is typical of uh, most uh, kurepu. Okay, so it's uh, rest. Thirty, 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 thirty. Okay, I think I better not sing it. I'll play it. <laughs> okay, so goes rest. One, two, three. So that's a call, and then now the response. Okay, then now um, there's a reduction in the duration. It goes like this. Right, so this uh, adds up to uh, 16 quaver counts. Then after that, there's a response. Okay, then now a further reduction to 8 quaver counts. Then the response, okay, then becomes uh, two counts, uh, uh, sorry, uh, four, four quaver counts, okay, then three quaver counts, then after that, combine together. Right, so this is uh, uh, the whole uh, structure. Uh, and if you look at it, there is um, the, the, I also use the on beat and off beat patterns here, right? So, uh, for example, you see the counting uh, written there. Uh, the first group is nine quavers, second group is nine quavers, and third group is nine quavers, then there's a group of three quavers. So uh, you, if you look at the accents, the first accent is on the on beat, second accent on the off beat, the third accent on the... Uh, wait a minute. Okay, uh, the third group, not the third accent, but the third group, uh, the, the one, again, it comes on the on beat, and then, then it comes on the off beat, right? So this also increases the rhythmic tension. Okay, so now... Uh, we could uh, listen to the whole uh, piece. And then this is uh, annotated with um, a score for you to follow also. <laughs>
Thank you for sharing your piece with us. Yeah, it was a very wonderful piece. But also I realised that you can, you know the rhythm and culture quite well. You've done a lot of research on it, but also you know a lot of languages. And so the both Confluence and Golden Snake or Pagoda Street are very intriguing blends of cultural and musical elements. Uh, you've told us about how you do it, but uh, why do you like to call Compose with this as, as compared to like normal composition. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, uh, I guess the first is because of my uh, background as in, in the Chinese orchestra. Uh, I, I think um, it's, it's a bit like uh, as one of the minority <laughs> genres, we have uh, also like like a sort of a sympathy and and uh, uh, interest in, in the other like uh, lesser known genres of music. Right. If I had been uh, purely educated in Western music, I might have thought like, okay, so maybe just Western music would be enough, right? Uh, but uh, 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 from uh, coming from Chinese music background, I was um, interested in in art music of uh, other cultures too. Um, that also uh, relates to many other things. So, for example, um, uh, the Singapore Chinese Orchestra since the um, around 20, uh, almost 20 years ago has been promoting this Nanyang style of music that yeah. tries to learn, you know, find um, musical resources from Southeast Asia, right, to, to have a different kind of Chinese music than what we have in uh, China or Taiwan or Hong Kong. Okay, so, um, yeah, uh, uh, I, I, for me, I also feel that I need to find a unique voice as a composer. So now, uh, I mean, for any career composer, actually, eventually, uh, any career composer will eventually meet the, uh, come to the question, uh, you know, with so many works in existence, why would people want to listen to mine or to play mine, right? Um, so that means I have to offer something special, right, that is uh, not uh, commonly seen in, in other compositions. And, and though, so this, uh, I consider this uh, multiculturalism as one of my uh, niche, in, in terms of composition. Talking about career, do you think knowing so many languages helps you with your career? And also, how did you come to learn so many? Yeah, okay. Uh, well, languages actually is just a, a, a interest uh, thing. Uh, right, so when I was, uh, when I was a young, my, my dad worked in a French company and then, then he occasionally brought back uh, like bilingual newsletters in, in English and French. And I thought, okay, French looks very cool. Uh, so, so when I had, uh, in secondary one, uh, there was opportunity to uh, sign up for a third language, so I chose French as my third language. Um, and then after that, um, in, in sec three, uh, we had uh, like history class on, on the Russian Revolution, and I thought uh, like <laughs> Russian looks cool also. I went to learn, uh, learn the Cyrillic script. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, then after that, at some point, then I, I uh, found the Arabic to be look cool also, so then I went to learn how to write in Arabic. So uh, I went to the National Library like to, to borrow um, books on, on the topic and, and then uh, in every library there's like at least one shelf of that's dedicated to uh, languages, yeah. right, uh, all the different languages. So, so, so when I was like uh, uh, picking an Arabic book then, then I see like Hebrew beside it, I say, mm, okay, now <laughs> I'll take a look at that also. Uh, and, and then like, yeah, so so uh, actually, uh, my uh, 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 like just now I, I said, uh, looks cool. So actually, my first interest actually in the looks of the <laughs> the, the language, uh, which means I was uh, uh, mainly interested in the the, the uh, handwriting and, and the calligraphy, right? So uh, so I learned the the writing, how to write uh, Hindi and mm. uh, Bangla and, and Tamil, right? But without actually learning the much of the language itself. Oh. Yeah. Uh, so the first language that I actually learned with a specific goal in mind is uh, German, right? So because um, after uh, near, near my graduation, then I was thinking, okay, what, what I'm going to do for uh, where I'm going to do go for uh, further studies. Uh, so I visited some like education fairs, and then um, the, then I found out that uh, in uh, uh, France and Germany, um, the education is actually almost free. Right, but you have to, uh, of course, attend the university in the native language. Um, so uh, then I look at you know all the uh, music 
related courses in, in France and Germany. I thought, you know, uh, with, with German, you can have, uh, you have Germany and Austria and uh, parts of Switzerland. Mm -hmm. so, so there's like more choices and I thought that then, you know, uh, uh, that I should just um, uh, focus on German and, and then uh, they have uh, like more choices of uh, university education, right? Um, so uh, yeah, then after that, when I uh, got to uh, Vienna, uh, I, uh, there, there were a lot of international students and mostly from within the EU uh, zone, right? So uh, then, then uh, I tried to pick up a bit of uh, many of the, the European Everything languages, <laughs> you know, like Czech, uh, Hungarian, Whoa. Croatian, uh, Polish, etc. So which do you think is the hardest language to learn or pronounce? Okay, the uh, hardest language to, to, to learn, um, uh, I, I think if, if we are not talking about uh, uh, native speakers' perspective, I, I think would be actually Chinese would be <laughs> one of the hardest, right? Because of the, the way it uh, works is very complex. Yeah. And actually, uh, the ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics mm. uh, comes quite close to uh, Chinese in the way it works, right? So, so it isn't like a pictorial uh, language, like you know, you, like like you draw a picture of a man walking. That means it's a man walking. It's, <laughs> it has it, it's actually um a lot of the uh, symbols uh, work in similar ways as uh, as a Chinese uh, script, right? So I think that would be probably one of the hardest languages, right, to to learn. Uh, okay, then to pronounce, I would think uh Polish would be quite high up in the list. Right, because it has lots of consonant clusters, mm. uh, and and uh, and and quite quite a lot of words have very few vowels. <laughs> right. So uh, I I've actually um, oh my god this is this is a, a famous uh, Polish tongue twister, right? Uh, and and it comes from a poem by this uh, poet named uh, Jan uh, Brzechwa. Okay, so, so his name is also a tongue twister, <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, so um, I'll, I'll try to read this and you can try to follow the text anyway. W Czebiesinie chrząszcz brzmi w czcinie i w Czebiesin z tego słynie wów go pita panie chrząszczu, po coś pan tak przęci w gąszczu? Okay, so <laughs> you can, as you can see that they are, they are very, okay, uh, they are very, uh, there's a lot of consonant clusters, so you have the f <laughs> so you have to say the, the whole thing in a in a chain. Yeah. And, and this is the, the phonetic transcription. Uh, so so uh, it is this is useful for, for visual visualizing like how the uh, language sounds and, and because when you uh, just learn by listening alone, sometimes you might misinterpret mm. the sound or like you think it you heard a sound that is similar to what you have in your native language, but actually it's an inaccurate pronunciation. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so <laughs> that's a diversion. Oh. Yeah, so talking about careers, when did you decide to become a composer? After studying or before that you already knew your path? Um, okay, so uh, this is... Uh, uh, okay, I mean, maybe I'll try to act, uh, uh, for, uh, trace my whole <laughs> <laughs> development. Okay, so when I was young, actually the music was just like a hobby thing. I didn't uh, think uh, very seriously about it. Um, then uh, in, in uh, secondary school, then I composed like uh, 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 pieces of my school Chinese orchestra. Uh, and then after that in, in JC, uh, at, at the, uh, in J2, I actually participated in the Singapore um, international competition for Chinese orchestral composition. So the first one uh, that was, uh, and it was held in 2006. Um, yeah, then, I, then I wrote a piece, composed a piece, The Sisters Islands, and I got an award for it also. Uh, so that is about when I started thinking of like going to music mm. uh, seriously and uh, particularly composition. Uh, but actually uh, I was like um, in, in uh, secondary school, I uh, was actually also equally interested in computer programming. <laughs> yeah. So uh, then, then I, I, uh, at one point, then I thought, okay, should I go more into programming or music? Then I thought, so you know, programming is quite tiring because you have to sit in front of the computer for many hours at a time. So I went into music, and now I also sit in front of the computer for <laughs> many hours at a time. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, and, and then, uh, so 
uh, in JC, I was doing a uh, maths, physics, uh, chemistry, uh, and, and a music elective program. Then uh, I thought it would be nice if I could find a course that also integrates some mm -hmm. uh, elements of science. And so I um, discovered this course, which is uh, called Tone Meister, uh, which roughly translates to audio engineering. But the, the word itself uh, literally means uh, sound master, mm. or like master of sound. Um, so it covers actually a wide uh, area, but uh, mainly it uh, deals with the integration of art and the art and science of sound. So for example, like a recording comes uh, under that, uh, but it's not recording just by, uh, you know, uh, 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 like pressing a record button, but also um, uh, recording with an analysis of the score mm. uh, and the interpretation. So basically, um, a tone meister um, doesn't just uh, record music, but also like uh, interpret the uh, music and also uh, like uh, in a lot of circumstances will guide the musicians to you know uh, you know communicate musicians. Okay, I actually I think this part was uh, you know uh, quite nice, but you know could we uh, try to ha have uh, uh, you know, more open sound. For example, they will say that the musicians and then it, uh, the musicians will play again and, and, and you know, so um, you basically you are like directing the mm. uh, recording based on the, uh, the, the interpretation of the score. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so that's what, uh, that's the uh, first uh, course that I actually enrolled for. Uh, so I went to uh, Vienna and, and uh, enrolled in the uh, Tone Meister uh, course. Um, so after I, uh, uh, starting out the course, then I, uh, uh, we, are, we are in the same institute as the composers and the conductors. Mm. Right? Then I uh, saw the look at the compo composition um, program and, and actually there's a lot of shared uh, uh, lessons, like uh, shared courses. Right? So uh, actually uh, we had like, uh, like music analysis or mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, music theory, a lot of lessons were like uh, uh, together, held together with the composers and mm. tone masters and the uh, uh, conductors, right? So, so then I uh, tried to find out more details and realized I can like you know uh, count some of my tone master uh, credits towards the composition course, right? So I went to audition for a composition course also and mm -hmm. I got a place in composition. Okay, so uh, this isn't like a double degree in the sense same sense as what we have in the uh, Anglophone uh, university, mm -hmm. so it's not like we have a double double degree. It means you have half of each. Mm -hmm. So uh, in uh, main mainland Europe, uh, continental Europe, uh, okay, at least in Vienna, um, you can theoretically sign up for an unlimited mm -hmm. uh, number of courses, um, and you graduate when you have fulfilled all the Requirement. requirements. And there is also no uh, deadline for you to mm -hmm. graduate. So so a uh, course is. Uh, normal, nominally uh, five years long, uh, like the program is designed in a way that it would take uh, normally five years, uh, but uh, uh, of course people who take more than one course, they will, they will take longer than five years and then, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, and, and, and then actually along the way you can choose to drop one or, or whatever, you know, or you can actually just sign up for um, a program and then to just to go for a few lessons that you, mm. you like to <laughs> attend, I mean that's also possible. Uh, yeah, so um, yeah, I signed up for a composition course, and then uh, uh, so so I did both uh, parallel uh, in uh, for for uh, uh, some time, and then uh, so so after that I had to decide uh, what uh, uh, which graduation exam to to mm -hmm. take. Right, uh, I figured out if I want to take both graduation exams, I need about additional two years, mm. which I thought you know if I had two years, I'd rather go for a doctorate. So, <laughs> you know, rather, yeah. So so I did, then then I, I chose uh, to take uh, the graduation exam in composition. Right. Mm. So at the time I felt I was uh, because uh, I, I would have also made a good uh, sound engineer, but then I felt I could make a bigger impact with my composition mm. than than with like uh, for example recording. Uh, mm. Yeah. I see, I see. So you have quite a journey in terms of choosing your career path. In that sense, do you have like any advice for any budding musicians here or people who are like unsure about their career path? Like any of the audience here? <laughs> yeah, who, who's a budding musician? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, uh, I, I guess there will be many more online, right? Yeah. So, um, 
Yeah. Uh, okay. For uh, pursuing music as a career, I think it's important for uh, for you to understand how the ecosystem works and where you fit into it. Okay, so maybe I'll start with uh, composition, right? Uh, basically, if you're a composer, you can't apply for a job. <laughs> yeah, there's no, you won't, will never see a, an advertisement in the newspaper, we are looking for a composer. Uh, it's like either people think of you or they don't. Mm. Uh, so that means, uh, basically, if you, uh, um, if in your, uh, before you actually go to university, you already been writing for some, uh, ensembles or orchestras, uh, and, and then there are people who are interested in playing your works, then that is a good start. Mm -hmm. uh, and then if not, like maybe during university time, uh, and then, then you have uh, start to, you know, uh, collaborate with, with various ensembles and orchestras, right? But uh, uh, if you only start thinking about it after graduation, then it might be uh, a, a, a difficult uh, situation because uh, then you are, in a, a extreme, uh, you're stressed to get like uh, income, and, and then you realize that nobody is thinking of you when 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 mm. you need a piece, right? So uh, that means you have to um, cultivate this the, these relationships early, right? Uh, yeah, and and you notice like um, uh, I was also once asked like uh, you know how how do I uh, if I want to uh, compose for. Uh, film and, and games, uh, you know, what should I study? And, and then, then I said, uh, the what you study is, is important, like you need the skills to be able to do all these things. But equally important is that you also need to be in that ecosystem, mm. right? Uh, if you have uh, fully equipped the, the skills to compose for film, but nobody in the film industry knows you, yeah. that, that is not going to help very much. And if you look at uh, all the uh, film composers, they are now co collaborating with like, uh, you know, uh, uh, well-known directors, they, they all started uh, together at a time where both were like, you know, maybe students or, mm. or unknown and, and, and penniless, e equally broke, you know. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and, and then they grew together. So that means, uh, you know, if you, uh, now you go to a well-known film director and you give him your resume, it's not going to, uh, you know, uh, uh, attract his attention because he, he already have um, uh, some uh, uh, you know, long-term collaborators. Mm. Yeah, so basically, uh, uh, you from from young, you will need to start to like you know um, collaborate with other uh, film still directors who are still students, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, for uh, performing musicians, uh, at least there is a chance to apply for jobs. Like you know, you have orchestra auditions, uh, or if you are going the teaching route, then you can uh, be a music teacher, or you can um, apply for. Uh, teaching positions too, right? So that is um, uh, a, a little bit uh, more uh, secure in terms of job prospects than as a composer. Uh, but then also you have to bear in mind that there are ma very limited vacancies in professional orchestras, mm. uh, and and uh, that so that cannot be the only thing that you are aiming for. Uh, you have to consider if you don't get that opportunity, uh, what. What opportunities can you create for yourself? I, I think I have a question about like, what if like, you want to pursue music but you don't want to do it now? Like, do you think it's very possible to like, pursue music later on in your life? Or do you think if you want to do music as a career, you have to hit the iron while it's hot? Uh, so you are t talking about uh, specifically as uh, about pursuing music as a career. Yeah, and, like and changing career later on, like you go and explore something first, then you go into music. Uh, okay, it is of course possible, yeah, but um, uh, uh, depends on what kind of career in music do you want. Uh, if it's a perform, uh, um, okay, for for solo performing, um, that is. Um, how to say, uh, it, it is a very competitive mm. um, uh, arena because uh, there, there are so many people who learn music in the world and, and uh, uh, if you take out the take look at the world as a whole, then there's a lot of uh, talent, right? So if you want to be uh, like a sol soloist, like a, do that, that, you know, the kind that goes on concert tours, uh, in, that is a very competitive 
uh, arena and then uh, not only you need to have uh, very good skills but also a huge team to actually manage you mm. yeah so um, uh, if you are going that route uh, I, I think it's, it's quite hard to come back after you have you know, done something else and try to go back to that uh, so those who uh, like uh, change career uh, uh, to become uh, uh, you know back to music then uh, maybe more likely will be like become a music teacher or a uh, composer. I think it is is possible also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I know composers who didn't study composition, but uh, like like uh, I know one who who studied history as a history major and then uh, um, then then came uh, uh, still composed. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I mean because he has been composing all all the while um, since since young. Uh, and, and just happens that uh, you know that he got involved in the uh, music industry, and, and there's uh, enough people who know him who still wants his works. Okay, so basically, um, actually, for that matter, uh, uh, you don't necessarily need a degree in music to do uh, a lot of music-related things. And I know um, a lot of people who uh, didn't study music in university but still became outstanding uh, teachers or uh, composers. Mm -hmm. um, so. Uh, the, the skill is of course important and, and uh, uh, education at the conservatory of course uh, is geared to uh, help you progress in your uh, career or, or reach your, what you want to achieve mm. faster than, than uh, you know, if you uh, study something else and then uh, yeah, so uh, of course it's not say it's uh, impossible um, yeah, I don't know whether answers your question. Yeah, it does. Thank you. Does anyone else want to ask anything about, like, you can ask him anything about his life, his career, his music. Okay, yes. Can you just say your name and, like, maybe whether you play any instruments or if you don't, it's also okay. Just anything about yourself. Tell us about yourself also. Uh, hi, I'm Dylan. I'm a freshie from Class of 2025. Um, I, I play piano and uh, percussion. I've been in Chinese orchestra since um, like primary school. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so my, my main questions are: uh, Do you have any recommendations for somebody who might be interested in just starting to learn about how to compose for Chinese orchestra? Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a bit of a specific question, but uh, would you mind sharing about how you ended up composing Zan Wang and the second version? Because uh, when I was in junior college, I played Zanwang with my JC Chinese Orchestra and uh, I attended a concert I think just last year and the version of Zanwang they played had like different elements from the one I played in JC like there was a fugue section in the middle so yeah it's a bit specific question but yeah if you don't mind could you answer I see you, you did your research okay uh, uh, I think maybe I'll answer the second one first uh, you, you, were you from TJC? <laughs> yeah I was from Meridian JC oh, oh Meridian JC okay uh Okay, so Zhang Wang is referring to one of the uh, pieces. Uh, okay, that piece, the first version I composed for the MOE music camp back in 2008. Uh, so, so that one I wrote it like, uh, try to write it as easy to play as possible. Because you know, it's a music camp, you have to, they have to put out the performance in like a few days, yeah. right? So, so it can't be something that, that takes too long to, to, to practice and, and rehearse. Um, then after that, I decided, uh, after a few years, I thought they needed an upgrade. <laughs> <So> <laughs> So, so uh, I just uh, like you know added in more bells and whistles uh, to mm. it, like like uh, you know uh, made made it like uh, something uh, right wrote something more exciting, uh, uh, and then uh, the third version was actually uh, commissioned by uh, Raffles Institution, so uh, they wanted to hold a concert with uh, uh, Chinese orchestra and the Western strings combined, um, and then so I uh, wrote this like extended cut of <laughs> uh, of it. Uh, and so now, now my uh, 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 I feel uh, if you ask me like which version I prefer most, then I would say it's the 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 um, extended uh, mm. uh, version, right? Because um, uh, uh, for for me, when I look back at my earlier works, uh, usually when I look back at it uh, after a few years, then I will notice like problems with it, <laughs> and I will try to like feel that okay, this needs to be a uh, no, I I think I should should edit this, uh, and, and um, so so uh, a lot of things is with regards to the detail, right? So the um the piece I've edited most is my uh 
the, the one that wrote for the competition, which is the Sisters Islands. So now it's already a uh, version 17. <laughs> so, you know, uh, and, and it's like, uh, uh, if you listen to each version, it's like the, the uh, overall feel, it sounds about the same. As if you are not very attentive, you won't right, really pick up the difference. But um, what I do is like, uh, uh, I don't like, you know, change the melody or something like that, mm. but uh, uh, I try to uh, see like, what can I do to make my intention at the time of composition uh, come out better. Mm. So, you know, at some part, then maybe I'll see, okay, uh, the, the way the voicing, you know, the, the assignment of the, the notes to different instruments, then I say, okay, this, this one actually, uh, I, I think at the time I wasn't so good at doing this yet. So now, now I know better, I will like reassign them a little bit, right? So, so now the, the overall effect, effect might sound uh, clearer or like a more, or grander, right? Mm. Without uh, actually changing the character of the piece. And a lot of it has to do with notation also. Uh, so, so for example, in, in the Sisters Islands, there's one part I notated as demi semi quavers at tempo 60. Oh. Uh, and, and then everybody like freak out, uh, uh, or not everybody, but most musicians will freak out because they, it looks very fast. Yeah. But actually it isn't because demi semi quavers at tempo 60 is actually semi quavers at tempo 120. Yeah. It, which is actually... Not that bad. Yeah, it's, it's not, not very fast. Uh, but but because it, it looks fast, then everybody just gets like a mental block, you know. So uh, then in one of my later versions, then I rewrote that section as semi quavers at tempo 120, okay. and suddenly everybody could play it better. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, so that that also uh, affects the um, yeah uh, right. Uh, so uh, yeah, thank you very much for playing playing Zhan Wang, uh, and, and and for playing the new version also. <laughs> Uh, okay, so your first question was, uh, uh, sorry, could, could you repeat your first question? Uh, yeah, I was going to ask about like, would you, what would you recommend uh, somebody who's interested in trying to compose a Chinese orchestra, how would they like start? Uh, okay, uh, ha have you composed anything at all before? Uh, no. no. <laughs> okay, uh, for composition, uh, uh, um, okay, I'll say in, in general, uh, there is this uh, 基本功, which is a basic uh, techniques as with playing uh, you know instruments or anything else uh, so the most important things are uh, harmony counterpoint form and orchestration okay so uh, uh, then you will say okay this is a, it's a very looks like it's a very eurocentric view uh, which which of course it is but um, the thing is that all, all these things that there's a good reason why uh, like composers across many centuries who didn't know each other like from Bach to Beethoven to uh, Brahms to uh, uh, Mahler or, or uh, learn the same rules uh, or, or the same system and, 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 uh, uh, and, and all uh, composed like outstanding works, right? So uh, uh, because um, uh, all, all this probably started with trial and error to and then over a few centuries then like the, the common, um, how to say, the, the, the Euro European composers like, reach a common consensus, okay, this is the kind of thing that actually works out well, right? Uh, and so, uh, uh, for, for us, uh, uh, as a beginner, it's uh, best to learn this, uh, all this uh, system as it was uh, taught in, in the earlier centuries, right? because it has, uh, it's a proven uh, system. Okay, so now uh, I feel that uh, there, there is uh, more talk about diversity with regards to like, you know, um, let's say uh, uh, pop music or uh, jazz music, then where, where a lot of these uh, like classical Western music rules don't apply or, or like Chinese music for that matter or Indian music, uh, which I, I think of course it is important to embrace diversity, but uh, for a beginning, the problem is that uh, if you start to embrace diversity right from the start, you don't, you end up not learning any system properly, mm -hmm. right? You know, so, okay, so very simple example, let's say you, uh, uh, when I was a uh, student, uh, right, a uh, uh, composition student, uh, I, when I, I wrote a parallel fifth in a, a harmony exercise, and, and then, uh, the, then my teacher will say, say, what, you have been doing harmony for so long and you still did a parallel fifth, it's unforgivable, you know, then, then you, know, should, you should be whacked. Okay, so, uh, 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 then, then uh, so, so uh, that, that means like, uh, that when I was learning, there was like no, absolutely no room for question, I just have to follow the rules. Uh, 
and then now, now if you have this kind of thing, then then you know you may, maybe I'll tell a student you have a parallel fifth year, then the student will say, uh, yeah, well, but then uh, you know uh, we have this kind of thing in pop, and, and we have it in jazz, and it's fine also. Then I say, well, I mean, of course it is fine in pop and, and in jazz, but the thing is that if you uh, if you are thinking always thinking of like uh, uh, you know it's not fine in here but fine in the other style then you actually don't learn anything properly it's like you know if you if you learn to play uh, soccer mm -hmm. uh, and, and then you throw the ball and the coach says no you cannot throw the ball I say yeah but you can throw the ball in basketball you know so then, then you, you, you then you end up not learning soccer properly and not learning basketball properly so mm -hmm. uh, so that's why I, I would uh, encourage uh, everybody who is learning composition to actually uh, uh, first, uh, strictly follow all the uh, the, the training of the, the classical uh, the compositional uh, disciplines, and then when you have mastered all, then then you can you know start to uh, go in other directions, right? So so like uh, you know Debussy is one of the uh, most well known. You then you say okay uh, no parallel face, but how come Debussy have a whole <laughs> whole page phase. of parallel face? Yes. And, and the the key is consistency because he uses it in a in a way that is consistent that that it becomes a style, yeah. right? Or, or there's this, all, all this discussion about breaking rules or not breaking rules, uh, which of course you, you can uh, 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 break the rules, but then you have to do so in a way that is consistent, then it becomes a stylistic feature, mm -hmm. right? If it, uh, it's like, uh, you know, if you have, uh, uh, okay, let's say you, you, you see a soccer game, right? everybody's kicking the ball and suddenly someone throws the ball, and, and then after everybody continues kicking, then you'll be like, hey, what, what happened? You know, this, it looks like something that is accidental. It comes out of nowhere, mm. right? So that, uh, uh, but let's say, you know, if it's a game like, you know, people like be kicking balls for five minutes, then suddenly someone blows a whistle and then people start throwing the ball. Mm. Then after five minutes, someone blows a whistle and everybody starts kicking again. Then you see, okay, actually this is there's a design to it. Mm. Then, then you'll feel that, okay, this is a convincing uh, design, right? Whereas the other one, you'll feel that, okay, this it was just an, Accident, it was not supposed to be there, it doesn't belong. Mm -hmm. uh, right, so um, that means uh, that there is a, a very, uh, uh, it's not a so simple thing as like, can we break rules or, or not break rules, but rather like uh, 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 what, how do you achieve consistency? And the, and the rules are there for the sake of consistency to, right, um, uh, because if you follow a particular set of rules, then you'll be consistent in that particular style. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so basically, uh, uh, if you um, have something that sounds accidental, the drawback of it is that uh, it will distract people's, it will attract people's attention to it, and and possibly uh, away from the thing that you want people to actually uh, attention. pay attention to. Right. So, uh, uh, I read this. Uh, book by Alan Belkin, one of the uh, he's a composition professor in in Canada. Uh, so he he classifies a uh, composition flaws as two. There's two main kinds. One is a a bump, and the other is a hole. Okay, so a bump is something that attracts attention to itself where it's not supposed to, and a hole is something that is missing in a uh, in in the the music where where it's uh, supposed to be present. Mm. Okay, so let's say if you have a parallel fifth in uh, in a like a classical kind of harmony, then that would classify as a bump, yeah. because uh, you have something that attracts people's attention, but you know, uh, but but in in a negative way, right? Uh, yeah. Okay. So so basically, um, uh, this for for any kind of composition, the most important is the uh, I would say that you have to go through the foundations. Um, then now, if you talk about Chinese music, okay. So Chinese orchestra is actually. Uh, it isn't the pure uh, a tra a traditional Chinese uh, musical genre because uh, it, uh, we, we was, I would say it's actually a hybrid of, of East and West, yeah. right? If you talk about traditional Chinese music like, like Nan Yin, which I've been learning in the past year, it, it's a totally different world, right? And, and uh, if you look at all the, the traditional Chinese music genres, which I would define the traditional as like a very minimal Western influence, Right, uh, you will see that they work very differently from, from how Western music does. And what we have in the Chinese orchestra is actually a very cosmopolitan kind of uh, music that, that is a combination of Chinese elements, uh, Chinese aesthetics, uh, but uh, it is very much rooted in, in Western music theory. So even if you are composing for Chinese orchestra, you have to be very strong in uh, Western music theory. 
And in addition to that, you also need to understand the um, idiom of the Chinese instruments. Okay, so uh, on one hand, you need the foundation in Western music theory. On the other hand, you also need to study the, the, tr the traditional Chinese instruments. Uh, and I would say the best way to do that is to actually uh, 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 listen to the traditional repertoire and read the score with, with, uh, together with it. Uh, and if you can uh, get your hands on the instrument, it's best to actually try to play it. I mean, even if you can't uh, play the piece fluently, at least you, 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 if you can even find the notes on the, on, on the instrument, then that's a good thing also because you will understand thoroughly how the instrument works. Uh, and I will say, uh, uh, learn from the traditional pieces because that, uh, those pieces uh, use the instrument in their most comfortable and, and natural mm. uh, state. Uh, then, and a lot of them are, are written by uh, performers themselves, right? So, so you really understand how each instrument works, and then, then when you compose for them, you can, uh, you know, make optimal use for all of it. Uh, yeah. So, uh, the the next step then, of course, is how to put all this together in a piece, uh, in an orchestral piece. So, uh. uh I would say uh, orchestration. So orchestration means the art of, um, you know, uh, having. Uh, how, how do I explain it? Putting things together. Yeah, putting uh, <laughs> instruments together into an orchestra setting, uh, is a lot harder for a Chinese orchestra than for the symphony orchestra, right? Because um, in in Western music, actually, uh, uh, from a very early stage, uh, they have been emphasizing on on mm. ensemble playing. Right uh, and and harmony. So so I would say the most uh, the the richness of Western music mainly comes from the harmony, and because harmony is so important in Western music, the instruments develop in a way to optimize harmony, and the musicians are also trained for that. Right. So so in Western music, the precision is very important. Right. You you have a Western flute. Right. You 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 press down the keys either one or zero. Right. Uh, and and uh, everything is designed to for a maximal pro, uh, precision. Uh, whereas in Chinese music, um, you 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 have a, a Chinese flute. You can you know uh, bend the pitch, and you have like anything. Uh, you can play any pitch in between yeah. two pitches, right? So so the the advantage of this is you can play all the Chinese melodic nuances. And the drawback is of course that if you need to play something very Western, then then you have uh, intonation difficulties. Um, so uh, uh, the I would say the the richness of uh, Chinese music or most, for that matter, most ethnic, uh, like non-Western musics uh, lie in their melodic nuances, yeah. right? So including the Chinese, including uh, uh, Indian, uh, Arab, etc. Et um, so that means uh, you have to balance your knowledge of the Western theory with this understanding and appreciation of um, the, the uh, melodic nuances. Uh, and stylistic nuances uh, in the music, so that you don't just end up uh, you know, composing a piece that sounds like a symphony orchestra piece that is played on Chinese mm. instruments, but, but you can also capture some of the essence of the uh, Chinese music, right? Um, and, and then the, uh, okay, so the Chinese instruments, actually they don't uh, blend very well. You need to pay extra attention to the, the combination of of sounds, so you can you can it is possible to make Chinese instruments fit together in a nice way, but it takes a bit more effort than mm. than when composing for a symphony orchestra. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I think we have one more question. Is there another question? Hello. Hello. Hello, Hi. yeah, okay. Hi, I'm Alex. Um, I play trombone. I'm a year four at Yale and US. Um, so, sorry, you play the trombone? Trombone. Trombone, okay. Yeah. Um, as a, you said that you spend a lot of time on the computer, but I'm just curious what the daily life of a composer like yourself looks like. What, uh, do you do, what is a daily, a normal day for you? Oh, daily life. Uh, actually, I, I rotate, a, 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 rotate across different <laughs> Things uh, every day is there's no like a uh, uh, fixed uh, like uh, like typical day um, so to say so so for example yesterday and today I've been preparing for this <laughs> talk and, and the and the slides right uh, 
Yeah, I, I guess it, it differs for, for different people. So some, some composers, they, uh, they, they might, uh, you know, set out the, the uh, block out their, their morning for composition or then, uh, like me, I, I'll, I'll prefer to do that in the late afternoon or, or evening. Um, and, and actually, usually composers I, uh, we don't, uh, uh, are not like full time uh, uh, composing. So, so like, for example, I have uh, teaching duties also. Uh, and then I have uh, also have uh, random other things like, you know, when somebody uh, uh, asked me for to provide uh, one, one uh, uh, English, uh, what, English and Chinese bilingual write-up about my piece, you know, then I have to, to write that. Um, or, or like, you know, somebody asked me for a score uh, or, or like, uh, uh, et cetera. So, so actually, uh, I'm, being, I'm doing a lot of different things per day and it depends on what request comes <laughs> up. Yeah. Okay, that's very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, remember our, our yeah. Uh, closing. <laughs> Yeah, and so because it's almost time, uh, we have a little surprise for you. Maybe. Yeah. Okay, so, so we were discussing like, you know, how, how are we going to end this session? Then I suggested, so maybe we'll invite the security guard to chase us out. <laughs> uh, but maybe uh, for a more uh, mu uh, musical uh, ending, I shall play something on the piano. Uh, okay, so uh, I, I, I've got nowhere the skills uh, of uh, children, but, but I, I believe this thing that I'm about to do is something that uh, she wouldn't be able to do it. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, this is uh, something that I, that I discovered when I was like a kid. Uh, so um, uh, it goes like this. So uh, this is uh, a, a technique of playing using the elbow, right? Uh, and uh, I, I just discovered I could use that to imitate the sound of the gu zheng. Okay, so it's like uh, I'll press a bass note with the bone of the elbow, right, then, then, then I uh, lie down my forearm and then use the, uh, the palm to, to play the, the upper notes. Right, so that is the one, uh, one iteration of it, and so now I shall try to play a piece with that. very interesting. So today we have, we are glad to have Chen Wei with us. He shared about his compositions and his very good compositions at that. Fusion music, as well as his cultural musical influences, his job, his career, and his like language. And that concludes like our Diversity Week event for today. And I would like to invite Rector Ku up on stage, who has been a very good help in all this. And also big thanks to Prof Zhuang for organizing everything. Yeah, and Rector Ku will present a token of appreciation. Oh, wow. <laughs> thank you very much, Rector Ku. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for coming today. And uh, yeah, that concludes our Diversity Week event for today. So thank you, Chong Wei. No, thank you very thank much. Thank you, everyone, for, yeah. and as well as the MICE team for all their wonderful help these past few days. The camera crew, lighting crew, and everyone who has helped in this. Yay! Yeah. Yeah, if you would like to relieve this pre wonderful presentation, the video of it will be up soon because it has been recorded. Yes, okay. Yes, good night, everyone. Yeah, good night. Thanks for coming.